Hello, hi, good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to uh, this IRMS London event. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to wait a couple of minutes just for people to join the webinar and then I'll kind of kickstart with intros and we'll get started on the event. So um, the chat bar is there for you. So please do say hi. Where are you dialing in from today? What's the weather like? So I'm in Bedfordshire. It was sunny and now it's clouding over. I'm in Dundee and same. <laughs> yeah. It's, it was very, very rainy and yes, oh, yeah. glorious. Hi, Ellen. So for everyone just joining, I will just give a couple more minutes for everyone to join the stream but hello welcome to the event chat bar is open please do say hi yes it was very rainy yesterday wasn't it karen <laughs> yeah better today hi everyone people joining from all over. Hello, everyone. Oh, the Falkland Islands. Oh, wow. wow. Hi, Chloe. Thank you for joining us. All right, literally, I'll just give it another minute and then we'll kick off. So we are recording the session, so it will be it won't be available straight after recording, but we will then be loading it up onto the RMS YouTube site so I will let everybody know after the event when it's live so not sure if it's sunny or not sunny in Edinburgh there Craig <laughs> oh uh, Netherlands hello Okay, so I will just start as we are a few minutes past the hour just to get us started. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. So um, just to confirm, this is an IRMS London event, Information Records Management Society. Um, hello, if you're a London group member, thank you for joining. If you're not a group member, hello, welcome to IRMS. Um, hopefully we can give you a flavour of the kind of events we run here. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so my name's Emma, Emma Whiteway. I'm the London Group Chair, although I am actually based in Bedfordshire, which is nearish London. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'm um, the Records Manager manager for the RSPB, which is a nature conservation charity uh, here in the UK. Um, and uh, thank you to Leadership Through Data as well uh, for helping me host this event. Um, and yeah, I want to introduce Rachel, Rachel Mitchell, who's very kindly um, speaking to us today about uh, records management, strategic power. So uh, with no further ado, Rachel, I will hand over to you. Um, just uh, please post uh, comments, questions in the chat, and we'll be kind of um, chatting through the events and there'll be opportunity at the end for questions as well. But um, Rachel, I will hand over to you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so my name is Rachel Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for letting me present to you today. Um, so a bit about my background. Like many, I think, on this call, I was 26 years as a civil servant. That makes me feel very old when I say that. Um, I started in science, um, moved into intelligence, and then, as we all do, ended up in the wonderful world of information. So currently, I um, am a a data protection officer and an information governance lead um, for a regulator, the Care Inspectorate in Scotland. But I'm also a consultant with my own little company called Rizio Solutions, and I work with leadership through data. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. I am passionate about information governance, um, and hopefully that will come through today. 
Um, but I'm also passionate about making technology represent what we want to do in information governance and not the other way around. I actually adopted this session. Um, somebody left us slightly in the lurch, so, um, so I stepped in. So it's been quite interesting because I had the title and then I had to pull together a presentation that underpinned that title. So it's been quite an interesting little journey, this one. Um, but I have enjoyed building on the theme of power. What's not to like about power? Um, I'm happy to take questions in the chat. People will spot them if I miss them. Um, so at the end of kind of each slide, I'll be checking the chat just to make sure that um, I haven't missed anything. Okay, so let's crack on. So in terms of power, one of the biggest ways that we can um, start to take power is by planning to invade another country. Um, we are not showing that as information governance people. We are actually talking about power in terms of planning a records management strategy. So I'd like to say that this slide refers to an article by Kevin Lippitt about the US and Canada planning to invade each other, apparently. I've done no fact checking, but there is a link if you would like to access it. Um, so our power comes from our records management strategy, as I've said, and there are some things that we need to think about in order to regain that power within an organization. So we need to think about a problem statement. What are we trying to solve? We need to really boil that down to a real simple statement, because if we don't understand what problem we're trying to fix, then how are we going to communicate that to other people? People, what resources do we have? What other people issues do we need to consider? Policies, have we got a solid foundation for our strategy upon which to build? And priorities, how do we determine what we can achieve and by when? Technology, is it an enabler or a disabler? I'm going to talk a lot more about that. And then outcomes. How do we know if we've, if we've actually succeeded? What does success actually look like? So that's really what we're going to talk through today. And hopefully we can have a bit of an interactive conversation about how you think we can gain the power within an organization. So let's start with our problem statement. People remember stories. One of the reasons I love working with leadership through data is that we use pictures and images rather than words. That is also a really valuable tool, which we'll talk about a bit more later on when we talk about people strategies. But when you've got your problem statement, you have to remember that this is part of a strategy. And this is obvious, but you need to think strategically. There's no point getting bogged down in the weeds of your information governance world and think about messaging around laws or details that people really aren't interested in from a strategic perspective. What is broken in your organization and why? Why is it important? Who's it important to? And just don't forget that people do remember stories. So rather than trying to get, as I said, bogged down in the detail, try to give them something that they'll remember. So you need to identify the difference between what you have now, which for many of us, we've been there with a bit of a picture on the left, and what it's going to be like once the problem is fixed. So you need to tell people about what journey you'll want them to, to go on with you in order to achieve that success. Don't focus on the benefits to you and your information governance team or information management. Focus on the benefits to your boss, to the delivery of the business plans of the organization, and obviously to the reduction of cost. We find that really hard to do from an information governance perspective, but you can do it. So also think about, we talk about the STAR method when we talk about our personal appraisals, but why not use a STAR method when you're actually thinking about strategizing? What's the situation? What's the task that you're trying to achieve? What actions are you gonna take? And what does the result look like? So still quiet on the chat? Everyone's still awake, hopefully. Risk is always a really, really good driver. Um, I've used risk strategically in a lot of different organizations. It's amazing how focused the mind can become when you put a black risk in front of someone. 
Um, so I really would drive that point that think about how risk is managed in your organization and how you can plug into that. Um, I find in different organizations, risk is managed in very different ways. Sometimes it's almost like a spreadsheet that you look at once a quarter and then throw away. Risk should be driving what you're doing as an organization, not just something that you're paying lip service to. And you need to find out what buttons to press in order to make that risk more visible within your organization and use those processes that probably already exist. So if you've got something like an audit and risk committee that have external members, for example, that's another really good way of, of getting some power back. Don't just use information commissioner office, case studies or um, stories about fines. It's a bit dry for people. <laughs> we love information governance, but not everybody does. Um, think about the shame of poor records management. What's going to actually take people by the neck and say, actually, you really need to listen to me. And I think it's newspaper articles. These were just two I found while I was sort of Googling away, getting ready for this presentation. Um, the links are on the slides, but it's very easy to find articles that are very well written from a newspaper's perspective to be punchy and to have those headlines. You're trying to persuade the organization that actually they don't want those headlines to happen to them. So use risk, but present it in a way which tells a story. Then the age old problem of landing your problem statement. So I've kind of gone back to the theme of war here. Don't know why, but I've got three different images here that show three different ways of landing an army or landing forces. What we know from this is one size doesn't always fit all. So you really need to think about how you're going to land your problem statement within the organization in order for people to understand it and realize how important it is so that you can get that power. Now, this slide, I feel that a lot of people will turn off when I've put this slide up. It's about communication is not just about words. We have all been on um, training courses that tell us this. But actually, do you actually take notice of this? Do you actually use this in order to do your strategizing? Do you actually think about how you're going to present to people or use pictures or images or stories or words rather than actually um, just putting a dry report together, for example? Tim, I'm liking your comments. So we do need to be comms and marketing experts. We need to take ourselves out of our team and think about what the organizations, what's important to them, what's our messaging. Um, exactly. Let's not be passive. Let's take back the power and be a bit more aggressive, a bit more assertive. A lot of people in our profession aren't that type of personality, which we'll talk about. So you have to think about how to land your problem statements in a way which you're comfortable with as well. So if you're not a person that likes to stand up and communicate in a big room, I'm not. My voice goes a bit funny and I feel like I'm going to cry. I love this, but everyone's hidden. <laughs> And it just feels like I'm chatting to Emma. Um, so you need to think about how best you can land the messages from your sort of opinion. Now, everybody, if there's lots of government people on this call, who was taught to create presentations in that way, bottom left? Come on, hands up. People must have been taught. You tell people what you're going to tell them at the beginning, then you tell them why you're telling them somewhere in the middle, and then you tell them again at the end. All these courses we went on about presentation styles. Okay, so who understands the significance of the orange juice picture? Why have I put a picture of orange juice on this slide? Can anyone tell me? Anybody old like me? No? Oh, people are typing. Amy, thank you very much. Rip it up and start again. Orange Juice with a Band, that was the title of the song. Sharon, you're too young. Um, so <laughs> please rip up that old style way of communicating. 
people just start to read the slides. And this is what Jackie and Leadership Through Data have taught, taught me. Actually, use pictures and images. People remember pictures and images. If there's one thing you're going to take away today, it's going to be about the rip it up and start again slide with the orange juice. You probably forget all the rest of my presentation, but that's fine because, you know, something's landed. So you need to think about how best... <laughs> Tim's now given me a whole history of Edwin Collins. Oh, he did. Um, I'm not very good on my music, Tim, so any other information you can provide would be great. Karen uses Lego. That's fascinating. Like the three C's, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, but in a way which people understand. Now, I also love this slide, which I pinched shamelessly with permission from um, our boss in leadership through data, Jackie. Apparently, all the statues in Rome were pretty colours, but it's all been washed away with the over time or I don't know if that's actually true. Don't Google it. Might not be. But I like the idea. Everyone is different. So how many people on this call have done the personality type tests where you go into a room, you take surveys and it tells you what kind of person you are? How many people have used that information? So I remember doing, <laughs> Sharon loves them. I remember doing a DISC personality test and actually it's still out there because um, I went onto the website. And it was proposed originally by a man called William Moulton Marston. Sounds very powerful, doesn't he? Um, his 1928 book, Emotions of Normal People, established the theory behind the DISC profiling. And I remember I did this back in, um, oh, Karen, you did DISC too. I like DISC. Um, I think we all sort of, What's the word I'm trying to think of? We all sort of seem to stick with the one we did first. And this was one I did first in my 30s, I think. Um, and I came out as an influencer, which at the time I remember feeling I was quite chuffed with that. Apart from the fact that apparently an influencer, you get up in the morning and you get dressed and you go out to work or you go to your home office and you start the day looking really smart and really presentable. But you finish the day looking like you actually have been in a battle. So you don't tend to maintain that neat, prim persona all day. And that's really me. I do start very neatly and then it goes downhill rapidly as the day goes on. Um, but I remember there was a personality type with the DISC called dominant. The D stands for dominant. And I analysed my boss as a dominant personality type. First off, annoyingly, he was immaculate from morning to night. None of this dishevelled by the end of the day business that I practiced. But more importantly, his personality type did not want detail. He wanted bullet points. He didn't want to know the detail behind it. He didn't want to know the thinking. And um, so everything I gave him was written in the pyramid style. So bullet points at the top, recommendations, front and centre. And then there was some detail if him or more importantly, one of his staff officers probably wanted to read it. So think about how you use these personality traits in people to actually land your point. Take that power back. We don't have to be the person that shouts the loudest, but if you use these little tools and techniques, then actually your point could be heard the most. And that's the important differentiation. So we need to get this balance of power back. We need to understand the enemy. So customer relationship management. Again, this is just a way of thinking about how you deal with different people. Just going to have a little swig of my coffee. Have a very big mug. Okay, have we all heard of the Reiki models or similar? Where you look at, in a project, you think about who's responsible, who's accountable, who should be consulted, and who should be informed. So one of the things I don't prescribe is zillions and zillions of project management paperwork tools before you even start to do any business. That's not what I'm advocating. But you do need to think about who your key stakeholders are when you're trying to land your strategy, and also who can help you land that message. It doesn't necessarily need to be somebody in your team. So for example, in the organization I'm in at the moment, 
my ally is actually the head of IT strategy. So he actually thinks very like-minded to me. So what I try to do is I get him on board when I'm trying to land any new projects or new ideas because it's safety in numbers, guys. We need to think, actually, who can help me to land that point with the wider organization? Who can speak a slightly different language to me so that people understand what I'm trying to say? Because information governance, we do have a very special um, terminology um, that we think everyone understands, but actually do they? Yes, Tim, get a coalition, 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 coalition of the willing around you. That is very true. The other thing I find, and I might be telling you something that you do all the time, but let's just remember that this is really good practice. If you're going to land something at a meeting, how many of you contact the people in advance that you want on your side and actually take them through your ideas and thinking? So pre-warn them what, what you're going to say doesn't mean they're necessarily going to agree with you, but at least you might have an argument ready which will combat some of their problems that they have with your project if you've already done that before you've gone even gone into the room. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember to think about the Reiki. Don't have hundreds of spreadsheets with thousands of people on. Just do a bit of a high-level board blast of, just sitting on your own. Who's responsible? Who's accountable? Who do I really need to consult and get on side? And who needs to be informed of what's happening? Because nobody likes surprises. Remember that one too. Okay, so I've thought about my strategy. I've thought about my um, people in terms of who within the organisation I need to get on side. Policies. Now, we all love a policy in information governance. How many people think their policies are read? Let's be honest. We write these things. Some are short, some are long, some are friendly, some are very unfriendly. Um, I, hand on heart, don't think anybody reads them. Unless they're really trying to find out something. Yeah, yeah. Only people who are forced to. Yeah, if they're going on a training course, maybe. I just, I don't read other people's policies. So why do we expect people to read ours? We don't really have the time, do we? To actually think through all these like detailed things. So think about what your policies need to be. Do they need to be 23 page documents with closed face type? They need to be simple. They need to be strong. Auditors read them, they do. They are, they are helpful documents. I'm not saying a policy isn't a helpful document, but do not think that it's going to be something that everybody in your organisation reads. Um, your strategy can be based on your vision, so your long-term vision, but the policy as well needs to be achievable. Don't write a policy based on a vision. Write a policy based on what people can do as this day that policy is published because you can't expect people to also try and deliver something that's unachievable. So your vision is one thing, but your policy needs to be about how people can comply and do what you want them to do now. And the amount of times I've seen policies that's almost like a bit jammed tomorrow. Anna, great idea. That's kind of the pyramid writing style again, bullet point summaries. What do people really need to understand? The other thing I've started to do around policies is videos. So literally almost reading the policy on a video in a bit of a friendly way. So people don't have to read a document. It's a bit more interactive. So that's another good way of doing it. So my mantra in my consultancy life is making it easy to do the right thing. If you don't, people won't. That is a really simple statement. But if you think about some of your policies and what you're asking people to do, are we making it easy to do the right thing? Chloe, that's a really good idea. Manage to get the policies as part of an HR induction process. It is good to get people as they come into the organisation, and that's probably the only time you are going to get them to read things. Oh, hello from Florida, Jacob. I bet it's a bit warmer there than it is here. <laughs> oh, dear. So this is a policy on a page from Leadership Through Data. This is your information lifecycle in M365. 
Use diagrams. Policies don't have to be massive wordy documents. You could have bullet points to explain this type of diagram, but isn't that nicer for a lot of people that sort of relate to diagrams rather than words, um, like the written word? Isn't that nicer, friendlier, quick, easy, easy to understand? Think about how you land in your policies. Can you see the wood from the trees? If you can't see the wood from the trees in your team, if you're thinking, oh my goodness, pulling your hair out, I've got too much to do, I don't know what I'm doing, how do you expect others to be able to understand what you're trying to achieve if you don't really understand it yourself? If your world's become too complicated? Um, I actually did a presentation at the RMS in Glasgow with my team. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that one. Um, but I'm passionate about being able to understand what workload my team has, statistics, time in motion studies. It's not going to be accurate. It's not going to be perfect. But the idea is you actually understand how long it takes for your team to do things. If you don't understand that, I really don't understand how you can either ask for more resources, say, actually, I can't take that on because I'm too busy without any sort of justification. So sort of be nice to yourself, find that pathway through your wood. And one of the big things that I always try and do is categorize my work. So I always look at three different categories, run, improve, transform. Everything that you do within your team should be able to fit into one of those categories. So run is your day job. How much and how long does your day job take? So for my um, other day job, um, that's things like subject access requests. That's things like freedom of information requests. It's requests from people within the organization for help and advice on data protection. How long does that day job actually take? And how much time does that mean you actually have to do improvement or transform work, to do all these amazing projects? Um, you can also look at it from the must, should, could type categorization. I tend to have a must, should, could list every day with things that I need to get done. Um, if you start to think about your work in this way, it's really quite amazing if you actually then start to measure it, how little time you might have for transformation work. Um, <laughs> Sharon does need that in your home life. You're very organized at work though, Sharon. Um, so I think this is a really good way of next time in your team meeting, actually think about your run, improve, transform work. Because if you haven't got time to do a strategic project, you haven't got time to do a strategic project. And you need to think about getting people with the right skills to help you to deliver some change. Don't try and take it on as part of the day job. I have been there before. And all you end up doing is feeling disappointed, overworked and underpaid. Don't be afraid to get project managers in, ask your organization. These people have skills for a reason. We all know that there are good and bad in every little role of life, but actually project managers, consultants, contractors, um, make sure they've walked the walk, make sure they've delivered something before you take them on, make sure they've got proof that they've delivered something similar, not just talked about it. So let's not let's try and be nice to ourselves, because actually, if you've got this powerful way of presenting your workload, managers can't argue with that. So take the power back into your own team. So technology. Oh, it's either, as we said earlier, an enabler or a disabler. With power, the power to control this technology also comes responsibility. Um, I imagine most of us are on a pathway in relation to M365. Am I right? Um, we've either rolled it out with very little controls or we've rolled it out with too many controls so people don't like it and aren't using it. It's finding that balance with technology. Um, I feel really passionate about this. And this is why I actually started to do consultancy in the first place. Because when I was starting to roll out M365 in my existing organization, um, the technology-led Microsoft partners that we were working with 
didn't listen to me. They would just would not listen to what I was trying to say in terms of information governance and trying not to make the same mistakes we'd already made before with um, shared drives and other digital data repositories. They kept telling me that's not how Microsoft want things to work. They want it to be all free and easy and, you know, everyone can do everything. Tough. We're information governance managers for a reason. We need to be able to take the power and control back within the technology and use the technology in order to help us deliver our day job. It is possible. Everything is possible in M365. And if anybody tells you it's not, then don't listen to them because the customer is actually always right. And you can be the customer in a lots of those circumstances. So when days become tough, this is one of the pictures I look at, which is Barbados. Um, but I thought I'd use this as the reflections as to um, where we are really with M365. So M365 and lots of other new technology offerings are evergreen. We are not um, Microsoft specialists. Unless you work 24 seven, understanding the changes, the rollouts, everything that's going on, um, you can't be, you're an information governance professional. You are not a Microsoft specialist. Let the Microsoft specialist tell you what's gonna be happening, what's coming up, what will benefit you, what might actually make you more of a challenge. Um, I've got a quote here, which was, absolute power was not meant for man, by William E. Channing. We can't be the masters of everything. And that's when you have to understand that actually you need a bit of help. Um, the IRMS M365 CAB, Customer Advisory Board, has made amazing changes in partnership with Microsoft. And we should be really proud of what they've achieved from our IRMS organization. Um, they've helped to shape Microsoft purview and the records management modules in M365. And that's an amazing partnership. And we're right in the middle of that and able to feed in to those discussions, which I think is absolutely fabulous. Um, the issue as well is we also need to think about our IT departments. They have gone through massive change. They have basically lost all their on-premise technology. They're not M365 specialists, a lot of people. They're not able to keep up with all the changes that are going on with the evergreen M365. So we also need to be a little bit sympathetic with our colleagues in IT because their world just does not look like anything like it used to. So what can we do about all of this? Well, I had to do a little advert at the end. So um, I don't know if you think that looks like me, but that's my little avatar from Leadership Through Data. Um, and the reason I joined them was um, the training on M365 is fabulous. They also have though, it's not just a hard sell, they also have free catch-ups on a quarterly basis. So effectively, they do all the hard work for you, so they understand what's going on with the M365 changes and what impacts that will make. But better than that, they do it from an information governance type perspective. Um, so I would highly recommend the catch-ups, even if we have no budget for training, then the catch-ups are really helpful. So that's kind of a little journey on how I think we can take the power back. Um, but I'd be interested to know about your views. So Emma, that was a quick run through. I hope that was okay. That was fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. I know a lot of what you're saying, I, I experienced myself as well. So really great tips there. So yeah, um, anybody have any questions? Anything you want to ask Rachel? Any kind of reflections? Oh, thank I'll you for that messages. It is a hard job we're doing in information governance. Definitely, definitely. And I I sometimes have to have the, like, because I work on SharePoint quite a lot, I'm sometimes, oh, can you help me with this side of SharePoint? And I have to say, no, 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 that's not my side of it. So <laughs> get my colleagues in digital technology in, that's true. involved as well. Uh, you've got I'll work within Google. Mm, interesting. That's interesting. Mm. Interested to know your experiences there, Claire. I haven't, I don't work in that myself. 
Oh, good. I'm thank glad, Karen. Even if there's one little idea in there that will help, it really is. Um, <laughs> Claire said Microsoft's a swear word. <laughs> uh, oh, Anna, I'm about to embark on the possibility of installing an EDRMS system for a very old organization that loves paper. Where on earth do I start? Do you know what? At the very beginning, and also, do not try another one of my mantras do not try to force paper style records management into the digital world. It doesn't work. So that's my biggest tip um you need to think about digital digital data and technology in a, a very different way than we used to about paper um oh thank you for the feedback Yvonne okay I think it's just Great. a bit of a, a loving in terms of everybody oh, yeah, being... say lots of <laughs> lots of lovely feedback Rachel um I'm just checking the chat. I'm just going to publish a few polls just in terms of future. Um, oh, except Livestorm doesn't like that. Sorry. I think we're there. Yeah, there's just a couple of polls around um, future topics for the London group. You'd be interested in just be great if you could just pop your attention quickly to the polls section. So it's one of the tabs next to the chat. You'll see it's polls. So those are live now. If you could just, if you wouldn't mind just repeat, have a look at those and any interest on an, on an online networking event as well. I will just check if there's any more, doesn't it like there's any more questions. Um, so thank you very, very much, Rachel. That was a really, really interesting talk. Uh, thank you for everyone coming today. I would just quickly in the chat plug our next events, which will be uh, a talk in October, on October the 11th from Alan Shipman around um, digitization. So that will be our next event on the 11th of October. That's an online event. You can sign up for it there. Um, thank you to Sharon and Leadership Through Data as well for uh, attending as well and so if there's no further questions or anything in the chat i will uh close off the event and just yeah thank you again everyone thank you rachel thank you leadership through data and yeah have a great rest of the day everyone and look forward to seeing you soon at another event thank you very much